this turned on, I just got a note on Facebook saying that due to poor internet connection, it was struggling to find a channel. But I think we're good now. It says we're live. Very nice. All right. Um, I'll give people a minute to, to let me know if it's working okay. You can send me a little comment just saying it's working. Uh, I love seeing where you guys are from. So if you want to say hi from the Netherlands, you make me happy. If you get tired of me and talking to me, you can look out the window. That's very nice, isn't it? That's the, uh, the mountains over on the other side is the Pacific Ocean. So this is a, an opportunity to, to look at a nice view. Um, what we'll talk about is training the dog in front of you. And we'll try to stick to healing examples because I think that gives us some context and focus. So when I talk about training the dog in front of you, yeah, you're joining, so we're good. When I talk about training the dog in front of you, I'm not talking about techniques. My techniques don't change hugely depending on what dog I'm looking at. What changes is the route that I use for any given dog to decide where it is I wanna go. So let's say I have a really driven dog, a young dog, and I wanna get started on healing. Hello from Romania. If I know I have a young, enthusiastic dog that's going to put a lot of power into the work, I'm gonna ask myself, what are the long-term problems I'm likely to have with this dog? Powerful dogs with a lot of drive, most likely you're gonna see forging, uh, crabbing, wrapping, errors of enthusiasm. If you push them too hard too early, you're gonna see whining and barking because it's very easy to take advantage of high drive dogs. People do it all the time. And then they don't know why their dog does the entire healing pattern going <laughs> It does it because you taught the dog that. Um, if you have a low drive dog, you're gonna be looking at your long term considerations. Low drive dogs are gonna struggle with endurance. Um, low drive dogs, if you pick at them, you know, you ask them to set up in healing and they're not perfectly straight and you get in, get in, get in, get in. If you do that, you've crushed the dog before you've even started because generally low drive dogs aren't sure they want to be there anyway. So if you start pushing, uh, you're heading in the wrong direction. High drive dogs, you can push at them, you can pick at them more. It's not good training, but you can do it uh, and they'll probably hold up okay. So that would be a really simple low drive, high drive. So now let's talk more specifically. Let's say that the dog is driven to work, really enthusiastic, likes to be out there, but um, not a lot of food drive. Well, that's fine. Uh, a lot of high drive dogs don't really have a lot of food drive. That's actually not that unusual. They may have a lot of toy drive. So let's say you wanna start working your high drive dog on a lot of precision behavior. And the reason you've opted for precision over uh, movement and games is because you know your dog has a lot of energy and is gonna bring a lot to the table. Wonderful, so you put your dog up and you start working on little bits of precision. But remember, your dog doesn't care that much about food. What are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna cut your repetitions way down. Maybe you're gonna do five repetitions of rear end awareness, because I think that's really important and I'll probably do it with all dogs. Um, and then get off the disc, go find something else to do, right? Sits, downs, whatever come back to your precision work with your food. Maybe you're gonna to wanna to throw the food rather than handing it to the dog. There's an offset if you throw food, right? Because you're losing your reward for position. When you want an exact head position that somebody asked me about earlier, and you really care, then you want the food to go in the dog's nose in exactly the spot where you want that nose long term. You will lose something, I can tell you that right now. Even if I feed super upright, my dogs don't stay that way. They drop their head a little, but it's still the picture, still there for me. If you have a really driven young dog, loves food, loves toys, the risk with those dogs in healing, because they bring so much to the table, they care a lot. Dogs that care a lot tend to learn fast. Dogs that learn fast tend to get progressed quickly. And here's where things get ugly. Dogs that get progressed quickly tend to be worked past where they should have been worked and rewarded. So they start to yell. <laughs> they won't opt out, they can't because they're too driven. So with those dogs, you're always thinking about the fact that you must monitor their behavior for them because they can't monitor it for themselves. So when you've got a three month old mal puppy that works and works so hard, never opts out, or a nice young German Shepherd dog, you have to pay attention. So does that mean you should just stay at the same simple work with a bored dog over and over? No, not at all. But what you shouldn't do is extend the rewards. So let's say 
You're giving your dog a cookie every seven seconds for some nice healing. And your young dog is brilliant, right? Your dog just gets it and knows it. So should you go for 10 seconds? No. Endurance is the last thing you should increase, especially with a dog that's high drive, bit on the frantic side, and not going to opt out because they're a little bit OCD about their objects, their toys, their food. But you can't have them bored and stagnating. So now the question is, can you do seven seconds of healing in my living room? Can you do seven seconds of healing when my feet are running in place? Can you do seven seconds of healing when there's another dog behind the glass? Can you do seven seconds of healing when I put my hand on my head? Can you do it when there's a distraction on the floor? Can you do it when I send you to the cookie? Can you do it? Always be uh, smooth and predictable in your handling, but that doesn't mean you have to be predictable. If I'm gonna make five right turns in a row and a left turn, those five right turns will have set the dog up for a pattern. So guess what happens when we get to the left? You threw the dog off, but that's fair as long as your handling is good. So there's a really simple example with a high drive dog of how you wanna think about um, structuring their training. How about a low drive dog? Well, with the lower drive dog, what's your long-term concern? Opting out, bored, not having a good time. So does that mean you should just toss precision out the window? No, because precision is not the opposite of energetic. What you do wanna do is don't pick at your dog, just, just don't. Ignore errors. Hell, reward errors. I don't even care. It's not even a problem. Get rid of halts. Get rid of stops and starts. So when you want to go into healing, clap your hands. Pop, pop, pop. Let's go. Turn and go. Get, get to work. Um, the more you set up, the more bored your dog will get, right? So now how about you've got this low drive dog and um, how many things are involved in healing? You've got left turns and right turns and fast and slow and halt and start. There's six, seven elements, something like that. Unfortunately, to get excellent, excellent work at those six or seven elements, you should be settling in. You're going to be at it for a couple of years because that's just the nature of the beast. If you have a lower drive dog, you'll kill them if you just keep working that way. So lower drive dog, higher rate of reinforcement, right? Make that interesting. But what, what does your dog care about? How about a lower drive dog that actually likes to move their body? Maybe not with you, but likes to move their body. Games. Can you teach the dog to spin? to run around a cone and drive back into position? What can you do that that dog might find reinforcing? How about more toys? Because as a general rule, toys give you more energy than food. And this is the weird part, even for dogs that have less toy drive than food drive. And the thing you wanna wrap your head around there is that toys require 100% concentration and food does not. So you can often get way prettier work if you switch to a toy than food, even if the dog would rather have food. So what's your offset? You have to shorten your sessions, okay? That's examples of training the dog in front of you. Higher will please to dogs. You have more options with dogs that actually care what you think than dogs that are just working for the food and the toys. If they really care what you think, you can ask for more. You can push harder, you can push longer, you can trial more. Um, dogs that really don't care what you think, that's fine. You can back chain them to a reward, but you wanna constantly keep them aware of what they are working for. What's out there, a toy or food? So how about the quality of the reinforcement that's off your body? Let's say you've got a really high drive dog and it doesn't care about you. So low will to please, high drive. That's not an unusual combination. Where do you go with that? Well, back chain the dog. Back chain it to a cookie or toys at the end of the, uh, the working session. Should that be high value or low value food and toys? That's gonna be a function of the dog too. What if you have a dog with low frustration tolerance? Well, then you want to use low value things to back chain to. If you use high value, you're going to have a dog doing the ah! thing again, right? Because they care too much. So your trick is going to be finding just enough value to the thing that you back chain to that the dog says, I don't need to go crazy. I can stay inside my head because I want that, but I don't want it so badly that I'm losing my, my head over it. But how about a dog that is a little bit lower drive, pretty low will to please, doesn't actually care that much about you and working with you. What value of thing are you going to back chain your reinforcement to? High value. Because as a general rule, low drive dogs don't have problems with frustration. Frustration is almost always linked to wanting something. If the dog doesn't want it, what is there to be frustrated about? The joke for me is the crate games. I've seen people doing crate games with dogs that really don't want to come out of the crate. So I'm like, well, you're missing the boat here. There's no point in doing impulse control exercises like crate games with a dog who doesn't have an impulse issue, huh? 
Um, but then I've also seen people with three-month-old Malinois puppies building their dry, go, 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 in protection. And I just think, you're a fool because a well-bred Malinois puppy does not need any dry building so that they'll want to do the sport, right? And then when they're a year old, they're like, oh, I don't know what to do. He screams the whole time. He won't out. He won't listen. You cause that problem. So when you train the dog in front of you, you look at the package right on that day that you have. Then you kind of consider where you think that package might go based on what you know of the dog, what you, your experiences are with training, uh, what the parents are like, those things matter. And then kind of be thinking all the time, what am I seeing today? What does this package look like today? And where is this package likely to go? So with a high drive dog who starts pushing me and healing, right away I'm thinking, what kind of maneuvers can I make to get this dog off my body a little bit? Because there's all kinds of things I can do. If a low drive dog starts pushing me, I tell you, we have a party, I celebrate. I am so excited when a lower drive dog decides it's gonna push me around a little bit because that's the problem, right? But when a high drive dog starts pushing me around, we're gonna have to start some rules. Earlier rather than later, or we're gonna have some problems. So there's the general concept. Now I'm gonna scroll back through and see if you guys have any questions or specific uh, dogs you kinda wanna look at and talk about. Okay. Let's look. This is the hard part is, um, I love Romania, how cool is that? Grand Canyon. Oh, you guys, this is so cool. The things I can tell my kids. When I was a kid, we did not have these cell phones. We didn't have computers. We had to go to the library if we wanted to learn something. So we just didn't learn things, did we? Elizabeth says 101 people are hiding in bathrooms at work all around the country to watch this. That's a good visual for me. All right. Good. Yeah, all right. So Catherine uh, Mancuso brings up the issue. I, I, she's referring back to... When you're working young, talented dogs, um, really don't be thinking trial prep. Be thinking proofing, distractions. Make the work interesting by virtue of the challenges, the gentle challenges that you add to the picture. So the whole, the whole question should be, can you do this? Wow, you did it, look at you. Can you do it if I make it just a wee bit harder? Oh, you're amazing, you did that too, you are a star. Don't overface your dog so they fall apart on you. But eventually what you're looking for is a dog that has been so successful so many ways that when you go to the dog show, it's just one more challenge, just one more thing that they know they can succeed at. Personal play, that has become her preference. I mean, how to use that. So Annie asks, how about personal play and work? Personally, if I had a choice of just one thing that the dog really loved, I would go with personal play. And the reason is the ring carryover is better for, obviously, for personal play than toy or food because um, most venues don't allow toys or food or they're very limited in the ring. Whereas personal play, while limited, is, is um, very present or you can make it very present. Um, what I would do with personal play though, you have a few options, but um, I do things like little claw hand over my dog's head. So I do things like that between exercises. I'm going to get you, get you, get you, get you like that. Something like that. That's a game we play and my dog jumps up to my hands um, to grab my hands. If you look at, there's a video on my YouTube channel, you can search the name as Kisu, C-I-S-U, and then put in Och, O-T-C-H, and run. And I think you'll see her arch run from utility and you'll see how much my hands are on that dog in the ring. And I've had a lot of people say, I had no idea you could even touch your dog that much in the ring. You most certainly can. You can have your hands on your dog a lot, just not inside the exercises. Um, but I love personal play for training. So how about something like you're healing along, you get very stiff and formal, and then out of nowhere, you just gently reach down, give your dog a little push and run off and let your dog chase you, right? So you wanna incorporate your play elements directly out of healing. Don't wait for the halts. Same thing with food or toys either. If, if every time you reward your dog, it's at a halt, you'll end up with good halts, but not much else. So that's kind of a losing proposition, huh? All right, a low drive dog who doesn't like toys at all and doesn't like to move. Food, you're gonna throw food. So if I have a low drive dog who doesn't, I mean, I'll tell you right now, if you really have a low drive dog who doesn't like toys at all and doesn't like to move, 
then I sure hope they like food because you need something, something that the dog cares about that matters, um, or you're gonna struggle, you know? So then the question is, what are your goals and how realistic are you and how far do you wanna go with the dog? What are you willing to tolerate? Um, most dogs do like to work. I'm gonna say 95%, I'm just gonna throw a number out there. Um, but there's 5% who uh, maybe they do and they like to sleep on the couch as well too. Um, so what I'm looking at, um, just my way of thinking, tends to be less about the goal, getting in the ring, and more about um, this opportunity in front of me. What can I do with this dog today that will make the dog just a bit stronger, right, in healing, for example, with a low drive dog? And I'm going to celebrate quarter second by quarter second because realistically that's what that dog needs from me, is, is to celebrate the most minute improvements in their behavior. Yeah, uh, Sam, it's good to know that a low-drive dog will take a few years to get nice healing. To be honest, all dogs take a long time to get nice healing because done well, it's a very uh, interesting and precise thing, right? It's kind of hard. Um, it's not, not simple, I don't think. Um, but it really kind of depends where you're coming from. And since I'm very much about the process, that doesn't bother me that much. I kind of enjoy the whole thing. Uh, settle in and celebrate your little successes. That's your best bet. Hello. Oh, Greece, excellent. I know, Christine, you used to hang out in libraries and read books, you learned a ton. Well, I still read books and I still hang out in libraries, but the fact that I can go online and get information instantly on anything I wanna know is mind blowing. A young shepherd that barks at other dogs on walks? Are we talking within healing, Michael? Um, that sounds, so that sounds like a totally different kind of issue and I would resolve that before I was doing any work at all. I always do behavior work first and, well, that's not true. I would do all my healing work and everything at home or in the house or whatever, but I wouldn't try to train it in the presence of other dogs until I'd worked that out. I wish it wasn't freezing. I'm sorry it's freezing on you. Um, I don't know if that's on my end or on your end. It seems like it's okay here. How do you reward in a little, uh, how do you reward in position with a little dog? You'll bend a lot. Um, with my small dog, he's, I think, well, he's fat right now, so he's probably about 11 pounds, but anyway, he's on the small side. Um, it's not nearly as much bending as people think it is because the dog should be reaching for your hand, but you will still have to bend. Um, the one thing I do for fronts, I usually spit food at him. I'm doing that for other reasons as well, but it does help with the bending. I also am incorporating more and more toy play because then I can just drop in his place. It's a little tiny glove that he can play with. I can drop it to him or I can throw it. The risk, of course, with throwing it is that I'm harming position. If I care, then I'm giving him food directly down my pants seam. A little rule of thumb, your, uh, this part of your wrist, if you're feeding this way, because that's how I feed my dog with my fingers here like this, and this is the outside of the head. So here's the dog's nose. I come down this way, right, like that. And I can structure the dog that way. If you're feeding like that, um, the majority of the time you're gonna end up getting a pretty uh, straight position. Anything you deviate from that, you're gonna struggle. But the trick there is that your wrist should always be on your body. Doesn't matter if it's a small dog or a big dog. If it's a small dog, my wrist might be on my kneecap. And if it's a big dog, my wrist might be all the way up on my waist. But my wrist can always touch my body when I reward. If the dog is out of position, you know, people say, but I can't because I, he's, you know, he's, he's too far forward, his head is too far forward, or he's too far to the right, but that's just really not your problem. If he wants the cookie, he'll change that quickly, right? So if you offer the food where the dog should be, next time the dog will be there. All right, I have a high toy and food drive dog. Our problem is the bowls and rally that contain food and toys. He immediately runs to them. Gail, that's an impulse control issue, not a healing issue. So what you really want to do is work, forget the healing, right? Go get my book, Beyond the Backyard. It, it'll walk you through step by step. It'll help you with that issue. Um, and then you're going to generalize that behavior to all the environments you can think of. But forget the healing, right? Uh, just a really quick little simple tip is cover those toys uh, or food with um, a woman's stocking. You can just put that right over the top of the bowl. That will help. But stop troweling while you work it out because that's, um, my guess is if it's only happening in the ring, there may also be a stress thing going on. It might be a version of zooming. Uh, you're lucky if it also happens in training. 
Um, work off leash, control the environment, not the dog. Control the food, not the dog. Incorporate a helper. But the book will exactly walk you through that, so I'm gonna let you, let you look into that. Can you talk about drive as in how you might assess high versus low as opposed to levels of interest, focus, engagement? Oh, Samantha, that's a really difficult one because my idea of drive in the next person's is different. Um, so drive is relative, right? Like, um, when I say dog's high drive, it's probably pretty high drive. An awful lot of people tell me they have a high drive dog, and when I meet the dog, I'm thinking, no, that's not high drive at all. So my background is the protection sports. So I wouldn't even worry about categorizing high and low drive. I would just look at behavior. What is the dog doing, right? So if your dog is pushing you hard to work, what you need to know is that in that circumstance, the dog has good drives and is pushing you. Levels of interest, in my opinion, are tightly intertwined with drives. Focus and engagement, um, but they can be trained for sure. High drive dogs often have more focus and engagement and levels of interest, but not necessarily. To me, drive, the question is, what is the dog focusing on? What I do want to differentiate, though, is for, uh, drive from energy, because those are not the same. Uh, if a dog is running and running and running and running through a space and people say, oh, look at all that drive, if I could only channel all that drive, um, you can't channel that because it's not drive. It's uh, movement without purpose. It's like a three-year-old boy who needs to take a nap. That is not usable. Um, when we become overstimulated, we often move, people and dogs, but that's not drive. Drive always has a focal point, right? So if a dog is digging madly at the couch because his ball is under the couch, that's drive. Right. If a dog is digging madly at the couch because he's bored and he's making trouble, that's not drive. That's mischief. When should you teach puppies healing? How much should you be doing with a 14-week-old GSD? Um, I start my puppies the day they show up. So if I get an 8-week-old puppy, I will probably right off the bat, first day, we're going to start working on play skills. And we're going to start working on a range of obedience skills that I like to teach. So I like to teach healing. I like to teach articles. I like to teach dumbbells. I like to teach positions, platforms. So I'll probably start all that stuff right away. I think age is kind of irrelevant. I like working with baby dogs. The deal with the baby dogs, though, is how much can how much time can you put to it? And the answer is very little. Uh, a couple minutes here, a couple minutes there. If the gods are smiling on you, you'd work your 14-week-old puppy 10 to 15 times a day for two minutes each. That would be awesome, right? So once an hour. He gets up from his little nap, he goes out, he potties, he comes in, he does two minutes of work for you, and then he does whatever you do with your puppy for the, you know, whatever you do. Um, short is the ticket, though. Short sessions. Okay. So high drive dog has been forging. More emphasis on positions. So not left turns as in running into your dog. Making sure you're positioning your food or your toy reward back where you want the dog. Um, it's very hard for a dog to forge if the food is back even behind your butt if you want. That's perfectly fine. Or on your hip if it's not quite that extreme. Um, I work more drills with dogs that are forging. So more pulling to the right. Um, pulling to the right, left turn, halt. Backwards, halt. Backwards, one step forward. Backwards, pull to the right, halt. So work that one through in your head. You will. Uh, dogs with um, overly high desire to please that easily leads to frustration. Jennifer, she asked about dogs with a high desire to please that easily lead to frustration. Dogs like that need excellent training. There's no way around it. So you have to really think before you get them out to train exactly how you're going to do it. And dogs that have high uh, frustration levels, I just reward the crap out of them. It doesn't even matter if they're wrong. It doesn't matter. It's up to me to structure airless learning. If I cannot structure airless learning, they get a free cookie. We end the session and I go think about it. Dogs that have good frustration tolerance, you have a little more uh, wiggle room to work at your skills. How do you know? Lila, how do you know when to reward everything, even mistakes, and when to start asking for more? My dog enjoys working, but gets distracted easily as soon as the rate of reinforcement goes down. Well, in training, I really, you know, okay, so let's assume we're shaping, we're in the very beginning phases. I need the dog to be right a lot, so I'm probably going to reward everything, and it's my job to set things up if I can so that the dog is always right. But realistically, Shaping involves letting the dog work out the differences, right? And they do know the difference. Dogs know when you're in a shaping session and when you're in a practicing session of things they know. So if they're shaping and I want to do sun articles, then I only put two out. 
So the odds are one and two. They're going to hit it fast. Click reward. Do it again. Click reward. But what about at the point when your dog is working the pile and knows scent articles? Now you put out five. You're not shaping anymore. You're expecting the dog to do it right. If the dog indicates and makes an error, my inclination is to reward, stop, rethink, because that's a different phase of training. Back up and see what I can do to make the dog more successful. Um, so your dog enjoys working but gets distracted easily as soon as the rate of reinforcement goes down. That's a hard one. Um, start messing around with what you're using to reinforce. So when you have really high rate of reinforcement, use Cheerios. When the rate of reinforcement goes down, bring out the big guns, right? Start thinking about back chaining to high value reinforcement. That might help you. What about a dog that lacks confidence for whatever reason? Well, deal with that before you deal with the healing, okay? Um, I'm not, the kinds of things you can do to build confidence are to try to structure the dog's situations where they have a lot of success. Um, but definitely work through socialization and exposure before you try to do healing in those environments. With the superfood motivated dog, how do you fake treats off your body when they keep trying to leave you to go back and stare at the food? Well, that doesn't bother me at all. Um, if a dog leaves me to go stare at the food, I usually just go stare at the food with them and we admire it together. I can, I can spend 10 minutes staring at the food bowl talking about how amazingly delicious those cookies are gonna be. And then we stop and we look at it together and I look at the dog and the dog looks at me. And then eventually the dog says, you're not gonna give me those, are you? And I said, well, actually I'm not. And then I walk away, and if the dog comes back to me, bang, that's it. We run back to that dish, we feed the dog. However, I don't teach that in healing. I teach the dog if you want something, and I put it on a counter or whatever, if you look at me, I'll give it to you. If you look at me and I ask you to sit and you do it, I give it to you. But I wouldn't teach that within healing. I wouldn't have a dog that's healing, 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 and then one day take the bowl of food, put it on a table somewhere, and go off healing with the dog, because that's a recipe for failure, right? So... Um, little tiny bits, but if the dog leaves me, to be honest, I encourage it. I'm like, oh, let's go look at, we're gonna admire those hot dogs together, and God, they look tasty. I would love to give you one. Yeah, they figure that out. They think you're not too bright, but that's okay. When am I coming to the UK? I think I am coming to the UK in August of next year. I'm not sure. Um, Mechanics of reward delivery is tough with all different sized dogs. Meh, meh. Hand goes higher, hand goes lower. You can do it. It does mean you'll do some bending though. Uh, with the little ones, um, you can do a lot of stuff on a bed when you start because it's just easier. And with big dogs, start getting that training in when they're younger and smaller and a little easier to manage. You're welcome, Wink. Um, some toys are huge, some treats are tiny. Yep. What about dogs who cannot raise their head up? If I feed on the pants seam, she's very far behind. Then move your hand forward. So in her case, it wouldn't make sense to feed on the pants seam. What you wanna do, but your wrist can still be on the pants seam, just not your, the food doesn't have to go in. So here's my pants seam, right? Here's my wrist. Most dogs you would do this, but in your dog you can do this. Um, and that would solve your problem. But when I say wrist on body, I'm just trying to help you out. If it comes to pass that having your hand two or three inches forward works better for you, then you'll have forearm on body. Um, but make sure you have something that you can tell yourself what to do rather than what not to do because humans are like dogs. So if I tell you, stop feeding the dog wide, that won't help you. If I tell you, put your wrist on your body, that will help you. Okay, so one thing that was recommended to me with food in regards to hand positioning was to use something that the dog can constantly nibble on. Let's see if I can open this up. String cheese, do I have an opinion? Yes, I have an opinion. If your dog is walking and eating, they are not thinking or learning. I've seen dogs that healed that way for six months. Tight leash, tight collar, food above their head, feeding, feeding. Food gone, dog gone. It's that simple. If you want your dog to think, don't put a cookie in front of their nose. Think about it for yourself, Sam. If somebody, if you were following a car down the street and you need to get to your friend's house and you knew that you were following a white Honda Odyssey and you stared at the back of that car, you could follow that car to your friend's house every day for six months and not learn how to get to your friend's house. 
That's the problem with blurring in healing. Why would the dog think? They're just walking. I mean, it's fine for muscle memory, but if you actually want the dog to learn something, that's different. If you want to learn how to get to your friend's house, you better be a part of the process. Turn left at the gas station, turn right at the grocery store, go till your speedometer says point tenth of a mile. In three days, you're going to know how to get there. That's the difference between luring and shaping. Now, some dogs are, and this is again, gets back to train the dog. Some dogs are way more susceptible to muscle memory than others. So great, if you have a dog that's awesome with muscle memory, you will get away with the cookie in front of the nose technique. I still don't like it, but you could do it. If you have a dog that's not susceptible to muscle memory, as soon as that cookie goes away, so does your healing. I mean, like 100%. So why, why make your life harder than it needs to be? Oh, so to teach a dog to stay engaged in heel position when you are quiet, go from quiet to explosive. So get very quiet, very still, stand there for two seconds. Just when the dog thinks it's nap time, take off running and feed, 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 feed. Make it a game so that silence predicts movement and action. Thank you, Daphne. So uh, Ellen, uh, if you want to look for a puppy for confirmation as well as performance, do you have suggestions for not being frustrated with a puppy who won't work? You know, you can pick, some people love their breed, whatever it is, and then they do sports with their breed. And other people love their sport and, and they get the dog for the sport. I don't think it's a right or a wrong. I don't care which one you do. But in fairness to the dog, you can't hold the dog responsible if you're asking it to do a sport that it's not terribly inclined towards or interested in. Um, knowing your breed, I think you can get both, but uh, at the end of the day, you, you select your priorities and then you just have to be somewhat realistic. Um, you know we have classes for that. Oh, Rachel, you taught traditional household obedience where if the dog gives an incorrect response, you give silence. So teaching him that silence is good. Yeah, I would never teach a dog that silence uh, meant they were wrong. I know people do it all the time, but I think it's an error, and that's why. Then when you happy, happy, happy voice, chatter, 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 and then you're quiet and the dog goes flat on you. Well, that's a training problem. I do the opposite. I tend to, when they're little and young and I'm being enthusiastic, look at you, you're doing a great job, a little more noise. But before I feed, I always go quiet. So it's, you're amazing, I'm so proud of you. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, cookie. So the dog starts to go, I like the chatter because I like my mom. I like the silence because I like my cookies. So just train that, you can just train that. Oh no, Nadia, this one was not a mistake. This one was on purpose. So a husky who just wants to run is no drive? Do you mean has no drive? I'm not sure I understand the question. Oh, wait, I think I, okay, you, I think I know what you're saying. Does a husky who just wants to run have no drive? No, the dog has drive to run. So drive can be for different things, right? So if a dog is digging at the couch for a ball, what is the dog's drive for? the ball. I will tell you though, most dogs that just run, I'm not talking about Huskies here, most dogs that just run are not, it's not a drive issue at all. It's a stress issue. It's an avoidance issue. Um, but that's again, a Husky is bred to run. So it's logical to me that a running Husky is running because it feels good to run. Um, even dogs that aren't bred to run, who run as a stress relieving maneuver, they still enjoy the activity itself. The question I'd ask there though, is the timing appropriate? Is the dog running right now for a reason? If the only time the dog decides to run is in the middle of work, that would, that would concern me greatly. Celine, my dog does whine a bit during heel training. Clearly I've pushed him too long. He's highly motivated by food. Is the whining barking uh, related to demand barking at all? I guess my question is, is it demand barking or frustration? And does the differentiation matter? I guess either way, it's not desirable. It actually doesn't matter. It's, um, in either case, it's an unhappy dog who's been pushed too hard. So 
the only the only way I would even bother to differentiate is when I think of demand barking, I tend to think of a conscious choice. And when I think of frustration, I think of an emotional reaction. Can you tell them apart? Maybe, maybe not. Um, often when I'm looking at it, I can tell or, or I can see a little bit of both, but I wouldn't sweat it too much. The big difference is if it's most dog trainers do not train in demand barking. It actually takes a little effort. The dog barks and you go, did you want a cookie? I mean, yeah, you'll teach demand barking, but dog trainers almost never do that. We tend to go the other way because we're very controlling, right? Dog barks and we say, oh, I can't reward that without recognizing that it was a frustration response because we set up training poorly. Um, my inclination is uh, don't sweat it too much, just feed like crazy, cut it off before the demand barking starts, and then life is good. If it gets to the point where the demand barking starts and you think the dog can't do better, just end the session because you're not going to go anywhere at that point. Um, Andre, what if your five-month-old puppy is healing on your daily walk? Do you reward that or just let him be? I don't allow it. I would put the dog on the other side. I would do anything. I would not bring uh, treats along, whatever. I do not want my dog to casually heal. Because if they casually heal, then they casually unheal. So they're healing and healing and healing and getting nothing and then they move out of position. Well, that's bad news then if you actually care later on. Is it bad to work a young puppy for longer sessions if they want it? Should I worry about mental fatigue if he's pushing you to work? No, if you're reading your dog word, I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. How do you motivate a very gentle low drive but willing to please dog to stop lagging on speed changes? I have tried luring and positioning the treats to where I want it to be, but he was still not get in heel position when we were moving quickly. As soon as you lean forward, throw that cookie as far as you can. When the dog catches up, lean forward. Don't even change your pace. Um, just lean your body or maybe run your feet, but at the same speed, throw a cookie forward. Just get your dog so that he starts to anticipate leaning your body forward a tiny bit or running your feet at the same pace causes you to throw cookies. Um, luring, yeah, might work, might not, but throwing food and, and release and reward. Don't worry about him doing right or not. Just reward until you get anticipation. Whoops, I feel like I'm gonna accidentally turn you guys off. Um, okay, I want pretty healing. I like the look of IPO healing more than the AKC, partly to the hand position and what uh, just looks like being totally in sync between handler and dog. Okay. I know, Richard, that was, so if you get tired of looking at me, just look out the window, it's fine. That's why I set up here. Um, Diane, I'm noticing that dog training involves a lot of appearing to be an idiot to our neighbors, to our spouses, to our dogs. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Would you do anything about pacing? I, um, my dogs don't tend to pace. I don't think I've ever had a problem. Right off the bat, the easiest answer is pull right because a dog cannot pace if they're going 90% forward, 10% pulling right, it's actually kind of impossible. So it knocks them out of the pace. Then when they do it, take two or three steps forward, reward the dog. Um, straight, boring lines cause pacing. Lack of engagement causes pacing. Some dogs just structurally, genetically, but if you pull to the right, you can take them out of it. No. If a dog is barking at you while being shaped, he's frustrated. You have to change something. Okay, are we done? What time is it? 4.07? So this is like, what, 40 minutes or so? That's probably enough to digest. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you go, okay? This is fun to do. And then we'll do another one on some other topic at some point. Um, if I have time and I uh, catch stuff later on, I'll, well, the problem with answering on Facebook later on is often it just takes more time to type out the answers, but if they're quick, I will. Okay, thanks guys, this was fun, bye.